The night before, I had dreamt of Darby. I was back in old Mr. Dakin's cow byre. The farmer's patient eyes and the long, drooping, moustached face looked down at me from his stooping height. It looks as though it's all without blossom, then, he said. And rested his hand briefly on the old cow's back. It was an enormous, work-swollen hand. Mr. Dakin's gaunt frame carried little flesh, but the grossly thickened fingers bore testimony to a life of toil. I dried off the needle and dropped it into the metal box where I carried my suture materials, scalpels, and blades. Well, it's up to you, of course, Mr. Dakin. But this is the third time I've had to stitch her teats, and I'm afraid it's going to keep on happening. Aye, it's just the shape she is. The farmer bent and examined the row of knots along the four-inch scar. Bad girl, you wouldn't believe could make such a mess. Just another cow standing on it. A cow's hoof is sharp, I said. It's nearly like a knife coming down. That was the worst of very old cows. Their udders dropped, and their teats became larger and more pendulous. So that when they lay down in their stalls, the vital milk-producing organ was pushed away to one side into the path of the neighbouring animals. If it wasn't Mabel on the right standing on it, it was Buttercup on the other side. There were only six cows in the little cobbled bar with its low roof and wooden partitions, and they all had names. You don't find cows with names any more, and there aren't any farmers like Mr. Dakin. Who somehow scratched the living from a herd of six milkers plus a few calves, pigs, and hens? Ah, well," he said, "I reckon Tow'd Lass doesn't owe me anything. I remember the night she was born twelve years ago. She was out of our daisy, and I carried her out.